Hello everyone, Enrique here from The Machine Must Work. Today we're gonna do our in-depth tutorial on Clips Exporter. If you haven't already watched our quick start, that's also a good one. So let's see what we have here. First option we have in the extension is to choose the encoding preset. Here we have a drop-down with all the presets available for the extension to use. This comes from the folders you selected or from presets you have imported. Let's take a look now how we can add more presets here. If we go into our preferences, and here we have an encoding preset section, you have two options here, either importing preset files or adding a presets folder, and then every file that it's an encoding preset that it's in that folder is also used. So if we go here now and choose import presets, I can go into this folder here and import a couple new presets that I created. Once we go back into the extension, we can see that those two presets are there. If we go back to the preferences, if you want to add a new encoding presets folder, you can just go in here, click add folder. We're gonna get that select dialog. I'm gonna go in here, find the folder. I have this one here with some additional presets. Let's go ahead, import this folder. You see that the folder is added to the list here. So now I have two folders in which I have presets and the extension is going to look for those presets in both folders. Let's go back in, back to the main section. So here we have now those two presets I had imported before, plus some presets from the folder. And in the folder I also have this additional preset 1 and 2. Since the extension found two presets with the same name, it's using the first one that it finds. If we go back here, when adding an import preset you have a couple options. By default, the extension is not going to overwrite any presets you have. If you import two presets with the same file name, it's just going to rename one of them. If you'd like to, when importing, only import presets that are not already on that folder, you can control and then click the Import Presets button, and you are going to only import the presets that are not already on that folder. If you choose to overwrite, because you created new ones or something like that, you can hold Control, Shift, Alt, and then click the Import Preset button. This way, the extension will then overwrite those presets. Quick tip here, if you want to open these preset folders for any reason to move files around, just click the, the button here that we created, and those will be then open in the file explorer. So this one was already open for me here. If I go back to Premiere, click the other one, you see that the explorer launches and I'm now on that folder. If you want to remove a presets folder, you can just and this removes the presets folder. Let's go back to the main section again. So here we can toggle between video and audio tracks. If we stay on video, we can see the options we have here. It's basically every video track you have in the sequence that it's open. And you also have a few additional options, either to render all locked tracks, all targeted tracks, and all visible tracks, or all tracks from the sequence. What each one of these does, let's take a quick look. If we go into our sequence here, if you go for all visible, only tracks that are visible here will be rendered, so in this case video 3 would not be rendered. If, on the other hand, we go ahead and target only video track 2, and we choose all targeted, only video track 2 would be rendered. If I decide to render only my locked tracks, I can go ahead, for example, lock video 1, video 2, and only those two tracks would be rendered. For now let's unlock this, let's go back up here. When switching to audio tracks, you get one different option here. And that's the only one that changes, it's this one here. It was the all visible for the video tracks and it's now the all not muted for audio. Which means, if we go back into the timeline, any tracks that are not muted would be rendered. In this case, audio 2 would be rendered and audio 1 and 3 would be skipped. Let's go back up. The solo track toggle here lets you solo the track while rendering each clip. So if I go ahead and turn this on, say I was rendering, for example, on video 2 down here, I was rendering this clip, the extension would go ahead and do this for us, turn off all the other tracks, so only that track is then visible. This is helpful if you don't want to have interference from other tracks. On the other hand, if I want to render this clip here, and I have this adjustment layer on top, I would go ahead and not solo the track, so this way, if my original tracks were like this, it would just go ahead and render them as it is. If we go back up to the solo track, 
there is a nice option in the preferences here. Solo linked item tracks. It's a little complicated, but you see how helpful this is. If we leave this on and we go ahead, go back here. If solo track is on, when we start our render, what would happen with these linked items? Here, for example, I have videos that have audio linked to them. So if I were to render, for example, video track one, for each clip that it's rendering, it's then gonna also solo that audio track. So if I were rendering video one here, what would happen is that the extension would go ahead and do this for us. So it would only leave video one as our visible track and it would also mute all the other audio tracks and only leave audio three because that's the linked audio to, to clip on video one. If we were to then render the next clip, the extension would keep video one on because that's where the clip's located, but it would switch audio two to unmuted and it would mute audio three so audio two is then soloed. So that's quite handy. If we go back up, we have our clip filters next. This is a nice drop down with plenty of filters. Let's go ahead and quickly talk through each one of them. The clip name starts is a filter that will then check if the clip name is starting with the string you gave it here, otherwise it ignores it. So for example, in my timeline, I have clips starting with A007. This way, only clips that start with A007 would be rendered, any other clips would be ignored. Next, we have clip name contains and clip name ends, very similar to the one we saw already. So you just would give it an input and it will check those names for you. The clip name is is also similar. You give it a string with the full clip name and it only renders that clip. Clip name is is also similar. It renders only clips with the exact name match that you gave here. So in my case, if I had a clip that was my movie, I would go ahead and render only that my movie clip in every spot that it's found on the timeline. The next filters we have is clip is selected and clip is not selected. Those are excluding ones. So once you select one of them, the other one is unavailable. If I go ahead and choose clip selected, you see that only clips that are selected on the timeline would then be rendered. The other ones would be ignored or the other way around if you select the rule that says clip not selected. So if we go back up here, Next, we would have ignore adjustment layers, pretty straightforward. If you have an adjustment layer that it's in any of the video tracks you selected, it will just be ignored. Next two are the clip duration is more than or clip duration is less than. If you select one of them, you can also select both if you want to have a certain range of clips that are rendered. I'm going to select both here, go back. Here you see that you can then add, for example, I want to render clips that have more than 5 seconds, but are less than 10 seconds. So only clips that are between 5 and 10 would be rendered. If we go back, let's see what's next here. These next two are also pretty straightforward. So we have the clip is within sequencing and out points and the clip is not within sequencing and out points. These are also excluding ones. So once you select one, the other one is not available. Say I selected this one. If I go back into the project here, if I go in, and out on my sequence, only clips within the in and out boundaries here would be rendered, the rest would be ignored. Let's go back up, see what's next. The clip in bin rule will only render clips that are in a selected bin in the project panel. So if I select this one, I go ahead here, choose my bin. If I go back into the project, and for example, I had a, my bin created here and I throw one of my clips here, that's then the only clip that it's going to be rendered. Any other clips that are not found in this bin are not rendered. Let's go back. Clip file extension is means that only clips that have the file extension you specify are going to be rendered. Ignore offline clips is going to skip any clips that are offline in your sequence. Last two, our clip is a nested sequence and clip is not a nested sequence. These are also excluding ones, so if you choose one, the other one is not available. So if I would go ahead and choose clip is a nested sequence, the extension would only render clips that are in your timeline that are actual nested sequences. The rest would be ignored. Important thing to know here is that these filters are stacking on top of each other. So if you select multiple rules, the clip has to pass through every one of the filters to then be rendered. So it's very nice to narrow down which clips you want to render. The next option we have here is the file name. 
The file name has a built-in dropdown that has some variables. If I double click here, I get a dropdown. And this helps us build our file name. So I can, for example, build my file name with clip names, with item names, clip file names. These first three here look pretty similar, but they're actually different. Clip name is the name that your clip has in the timeline. If you didn't know, Premiere lets you have one name here in the timeline, lets you have a different name here in the project panel. Then the clip file name would be yet another name that it's the actual file itself in the file system. Since these three could be different, we gave you the option to choose any of them. Then we have a few here that are pretty straightforward. We have the sequence name, the sequence resolution. Since the sequence resolution already gives you something like this, we also gave you the option of using the sequence width and height, and then you can build that file name the way you'd want. The track name is going to get the name of the track that contains the clip being rendered, and also add that to the file name. The clip index, it's the index of the clip in that track. The project name is also the name of the project file. The counter option is a counter that increments for every clip you're rendering. So for example, if I were to render a sequence with, I don't know, a thousand clips, each clip would then be numbered between one and one thousand. This counter is reset every time we start a new export. So every time I click that active sequence button or the selected bin, that counter is reset. The next variables we have here are regarding the date. So we can either add the full date or specific parts of the date if you want to customize the file name even more. This drop down is easily accessible by pressing the down arrow on your keyboard or by double clicking with your mouse or by hitting shift space on your keyboard. So you have three options there to easily access it. If you want to add custom characters, you can just go ahead, type them in and hit enter, and they are added. If you then want to add variables, you can go ahead, add as many as you'd like here. If you want to put something in between those things that you already created, just use your left and right arrows to move that field around, and this lets you add things in, in between things that you already created. And if you want to erase it, if this text field here is empty, you just go ahead and hit backspace and it erases those for you. The output folder gives you three options here. You can either choose a custom folder that you just select from a dialog, or you can choose the project or the clip folder. The project folder, it's the folder where the project file is located. Every clip is then rendered to that folder. The clip folder is a more dynamic option. So if you have clips in different folders, those exported clips are then going into those same folders. If you choose this option and you have nested clips in your sequence, those nested ones are then rendered to the project folder as a fallback since the extension cannot look for the clip folder. In the export section, we have some simple options here, either to turn on or off Adobe Media Encoder. If it's on, the extension launches Media Encoder and kills those clips into Media Encoder. If it's off, the extension renders in Premiere. The next one is to render then either the active sequence or a selected bin. If we render the active sequence, your sequence that it's open here in the project panel is the one that it's going to be rendered. If you choose selected bin and you have a bin here in the project panel with sequences that you want to render, you just select that bin and those are the sequences that are then going to be rendered. The refresh extension lets you refresh for any changes that might have happened. For example, if you were in your encoding presets here and you moved files around or deleted something from those folders you already chose, you can go ahead and hit refresh. So for example, I have these two presets here. If I go back into that folder and I delete preset one and two, if I go back into the extension, you see that they are still there. If I try to render, I'm gonna get an error because they don't exist anymore. If I hit refresh, they are now not there anymore and we can keep on going. If, for example, you added a track, same thing. So I have now audio one, two, and three here. If I add a new audio track, let's go ahead and add a track here. If I go back up, that track is not listed yet. If I say refresh, I can go here and it's there. Another way of refreshing just the tracks is to toggle between video and audio and the extension then refreshes for you. Another way of refreshing is if you go here in the preferences, we have an auto refresh that you can then leave on. You can choose the interval that it's auto-refreshing. 
and the extension is going to go ahead and refresh, for example, every five seconds. This is up to you. If you have a huge project and you feel that it's taking a hit on your processing power, you can leave this off and then manually refresh if it's needed. For simple projects, you won't see the difference. The next option we have here that we didn't talk about is to auto load the last used settings. So if I go back here, I have now this ProRes preset. Let's say I had video track three, I have solo on, I have the clip is selected filter, I have a nice file name that I had built before already, and I have my folder selected. If that option is on, I'm now gonna go ahead close the panel so the extension is now closed or Premiere could have restarted for example if you turn off the machine or something auto save if we go here clips exporter open it again the extension is now launched with those settings it remembers everything we've done before that's very handy it's a time saver if we go back to the preferences the last options we have here are regarding notifications and managing the preference. Notifications, you have three options, either let me know everything, tell me just some things, and bother me with errors only. You see those are different levels of notifications. If you feel like you're getting too much, just go to a different one. The one that gives you the least notifications is bother me with errors only. They tell me just some things, might give you some warnings if something was wrong, and the let me know everything gives you every notification that it's needed. Last, manage preferences. Here you can easily import and export your preferences if you want to put this in another machine or something. And you can also reset your preferences. Let's go back and render something. I'm going to go ahead and choose the all visible tracks option. Let's leave solo track on. Clip is selected as a rule is a good one. Keep that file name. Let's go into the output folder. Go with project folder. Let's also go ahead and ignore adjustment layers, why not? I'm gonna go ahead, go with active sequence and let the extension do its thing here. Thanks for watching, we hope you enjoyed it. This was an in-depth tutorial on Clips Exporter. If you haven't got it yet, go to ascripts.com and get it there.